Welcome back everyone. Day two of CUBE live coverage here in San Francisco from RSA Conference 2023. I'm John Furrier, host of the CUBE with Dave Vellante, extracting the signal noise with the events. Dave, we're back at events now and you're seeing the, the full steady state was 2019, 2018 numbers picking back up. RSA, again, continues on KubeCon. We were just out in Europe last week, which is sold out, waiting list. Events are back, steady state, the Cube is back. We'll do a lot more editorial events, so just let everyone know, it's really fun to be back. Um, now I'd say the shows aren't as many. People, I think, consolidated their main shows who didn't deserve to have their own conference. Typical big companies that think they can have their own show. But the big shows are getting bigger. RSA, KubeCon, Linux Foundation. Mobile World Congress, MWC. Mobile World Congress, uh, uh, SuperCloud, our show has got great traction. Um, it's kind of like a business version of CNCF's uh, supercomputing shows, Kubernetes show, Kubernetes, supercomputing, Dell Tech World, HPE Discover, all back. Yeah. So really great news. Um, I mean, again, you and I tried to get into the keynote. Um, you have press credentials, I had full pass credentials. You got you couldn't, but still couldn't even get in. You had to go to the overflow room. So, so RSA pounding keynotes all week. The content is flowing. Day two, what's the big theme? What are you sensing well, is going to happen so today? So, a lot of AI and generative AI, no surprise at this conference, but you know, the one thing that's missing, John, is I've been, I've been poking and we talked to Sunil Pati, who was representing, he was a Goog he's a Google, he's representing Mandiant, the recent acquisition. Like, how much are the adversaries actually using AI? Are they finding, are they, are they seeing signatures? You know they're doing it. They're talking about it on the dark web. They're talking about like, okay, how do we use this? What's working, what's not working? But there's no like, clear evidence, at least that I've found yet. We have uh, Wendy Whitmore coming, <laughs> coming on, on later. Dave, you know what's there's, happening. If there's no evidence, that means it's going on right no, now. No, of course, it's it's absolutely. I believe, so, from what but, I heard, but, but it's But just happening. in terms of, it, it's absolutely happening, but in terms of getting c companies that have visibility to talk about it, Wendy Whitmore is coming on later today from Unit 42. And they have threat surveillance, so they know. From Mandy knows too. What's that? Palo Alto no. Networks or Palo Alto. And so, you know, and she's pretty forthcoming. So I, I want to know, are you seeing signatures that are GPT foundation model? They've probably been seeing them for years, but they're not really talking about it. Or maybe they don't have the hard evidence, like the double hack that we just saw. I think, I think so it's going to definitely come out. From what I heard um, from the New York Times reporter who covers cyber, um, there's chat GPTs being used for zero day attacks, looking for, looking for code uh, in the software supply chain. That's why it's such a hot topic. So zero code, I mean zero day is obviously a target. I know people are writing emails for spear phishing. Of course. That's coming up a lot, as you mentioned, in a double supply chain attack. So I know for a fact that there are people who are saying, it's happening, we're worried about it. And I think it's just going to be discovered and we're going to have kind of like that log4j moment where it's like, oh, it's out there. So, and so Sunil Pati was interesting yesterday because Google, of course, has a lot at stake, right? I mean, they're so big, they got, you know, they're the big whale. They got a lot to lose if they screw it up. So what he said is their strategy is to really go after the low hanging fruit, the, the, the low risk, high reward type of stuff. So, yeah. you know, automating, you know, some of the prioritization, using AI to do that, that's some of the obvious stuff. I kind of try to push him on, okay, well, when do you get to the high risk, high reward stuff? You know, are you going to be a fast follower? Or, and you kind of, you know, hedge that. You know, which I understand, they're not going to, I don't, I wouldn't think Google is going to be the pioneer. You know, they're going to let someone like OpenAI do that, but then Microsoft's involved too. They, you know, do they do they have as much to lose? I mean, they got a big security business. You know, could could Microsoft's move their speed to market could it potentially backfire on them? Well, I think it, well, it could backfire on. I'll give you an example. One of the things that's come up, and it's not that's going to slow down AI so much. It's more the legal frameworks don't exist. There's no case law yet that's kind of looking at this large language model impact because large language model essentially strip mines the, the internet and strip mines also copyright potential, also intellectual property. So we talked about this on CubePod. You had a perspective on this. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, we brought it up in context to uh, licensing rights, but now it's even more complicated because if you look at what is uh, intellectual property theft, and the question is, you brought up Google, you put up a website on, and thing and put it in this frame. But that's just navigating, aggregating, to buy it, curating, okay. Curating and you, and you don't see it the same way. I see it this way, and this is what experts are saying. They're saying that if you could, te the test is, can I, based upon the information that ChatGPT gave me, where do I buy the product? Or where do I buy the content? So what's behind the copyright? And the answer with Google was, if, if you have a directory of links and navigation and search engine, there's the click, I can go consume your site for free, I'm not paying for it, but I'm consuming it via the link. You can say pay for the subscription, so you can buy the content they're representing you in a, in a redirect. That's distribution. A ChatGPT is actually giving you content that someone else did. And they're also blending what that is. 
and what it becomes. And so you can take something that has intellectual property rights to it and make it look completely different, that's plagiarism. That's, so should they be paying theory. for that? How do you, how do you well, adjudicate that? The, how do you determine the, that they should, what should the they big, pay? The big fight that happened in the internet days for the folks watching, even our young crew here understands uh, thievery because they were part of the LimeWire generation. Music, yeah. You know, they understand how to steal music. And that's obviously the, you know, music went through this. It was that doesn't happen anymore <laughs> with movies, does it? <laughs> 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 we used to watch all the football games on uh, Reddit, but you know, that, that they clamped down on that. Um, no, but music probably was the, is probably the one instance in our generation where the case law went into it, litigating the, the label, the record labels, when MP3s are being shared, Napster and then LimeWire, that was viewed as theft. But you know what's funny, John? And then iPhone came out when, with Jobs, Steve Jobs, and they said, let's commercialize it, complete refactor it. So totally. again, they ended up, did change the business. But of course, what did we do when we were kids? We were making tapes, cassette tapes, yeah, right, from them. albums, <laughs> right? And yeah. nobody would have said a thing, but it was happening. Were you one of those guys that went to the movie volume. theaters and filmed it and then sold it in New no, York City? No, not I, no. <laughs> no, but I would make a lot of tapes, you know, a lot of, a lot of DJ tapes. <laughs> of course, legs. that was not a problem, <laughs> right? We would share tapes and that actually, that actually helped the music industry. I used to steal source code and distribute it. Back then, there was software you had to pay for, like Unix, AT&T. That was before open source. I mean, literally, the younger generation here doesn't understand that back in the 80s, you had to pay for software. It wasn't free. Berkeley Unix yeah. was free. Yeah. Right? That was AT&T, reverse engineered. And so, you know, I think we're living in a whole nother generation. I think law will come in on this. So if, if it takes the form of like the MP3 music battle, that's the closest case law that I can think of, Dave, that matches kind of the, what's happening here with the LLMs because it is being stolen content. If you have great content of breaking analysis that's paid for and a subscription or you own it with a copyright, that's legally yours and if they take your content okay. and reshape it into another but, product, but let me, that's let a me, derivative work. Let me, let me pose a, 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 an analogy for you. You live in California. In California, there's no non-competes, okay? Let's say you work for a company. Say you work for Google and you work on some you know, kick-ass project, okay, and you have information in your head, and we see this all the time. Okay, you see a company is formed from a bunch of Google or Facebook mm -hmm. you know, engineers yep. with information that's in their head. Okay, so I, is that copyright infringement or is that intellectual property theft? No, because it's all in your head. Yeah. How are they going to determine yeah. what is that's why I copyright love this. That's material why, that's and, where why, and what the source of this well, material that's, is? That's why I love this trend so much because it's very revolutionary. It's disruptive. It's a disruptive enabler. It's going to disrupt but yet enable opportunities. And I think that's the key to this business. Is look at the security business. We're here at RSA. This is probably the one of the most oldest shows. Supercomputing I think is older. It goes back to 1988. This is just ripe for disruption. I mean, look around. I mean, you mentioned it on your post. They're still talking about the same stuff they were talking about 15 same thing, years ago. Right, it's, it's, it's back to the future, right? I mean, it's the same old, same old, you know, it's patching, it's identity, I mean, it's, it's, it's security, the same problem. The, the security industry, Merritt Bear at RS, uh, AWS mentioned it yesterday, is ripe for destruction, and the, the games that's being played, and she used the Marvel um, superhero example, is there's a lot of bad guys out there, multiple forms, so we need a Clash of the Titans moment here, where it's like, you get the good guys and you get the bad guys, and the game is changed, and the game has to be changed to win the game, so if you don't change your, f your ability to play the game, you will lose, because the, 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 the bad guys are getting better, faster, smarter, cheaper, and they're, they're doing new techniques. And Amazon and the hyperscalers and the super cloud players that we're highlighting, they have pattern recognition data, they have observational space, there's observability, they can look at things and do honey pots, do all kinds of test um, uh, devices put out there for hackers, they can start to see their moves, and this becomes a game of cat and mouse at, at a level that only large scale cloud could handle. So uh, if you're not, to me, large scale data sets here, AI won't work. But, but, and, and but you know as well as I do, we're, we're, if you look back, I mean, are, we, are we better at security today than we were 10 years ago? Absolutely, no question about it. The problem is Well, is that, the, is that because of cloud or is it because the on-premise software is better? I, I, I think we're, the, the industry is just way, way more sophisticated. Yeah. Here's the problem. The API economy that the cloud brought about created so many seams and so much more complexity. So you have more tools, more complexity, less skills, and as a result, we're no more safe. Yeah. Okay, in fact, I would argue we're less safe because there's just more seams and there's yeah. more, and we have well, more to lose now. We had, we had the, so, the CTO, Sonotype, on yesterday. He said, on the cube, Kubernetes and microservices, that market, those clusters are on, their security's off by default. 
Okay. So it's, they're already hampered, and then uh, you mean you have, have to opt in? It's yeah, for you security. Have to turn it. They don't even know what it is. There's no <laughs> posture. It's 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 born without security. Yeah. Since you have to bend it, that's why shift left and security so it's a topic, managed services in Kubernetes. We had Merritt Bear on yesterday talking about the, um, the Amazon's uh, um, encryption keys, their service, their key, um, their key service. It's large scale, low latency. So again, the difference between moving slow and having scale is going to make the difference because if you're going to automate, you need the data and the data has to come from more data points, not siloed, bespoke databases. You have to have observation space and access to data. Uh, and I think that's where I'll see Solutions. I don't see anything out there right now that's close. Well, and I don't, and I don't see the public policy, the government, actually being in a position to solve this problem. There's an adversarial relationship with technology companies, you know, generally, and 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 specifically, there's a lot of finger wagging at companies. You got to do better. But now, you know, take a look at the Coinbase situation. So Coinbase yeah. just just sued the SEC because the SEC didn't respond to a petition and a request for the SEC to actually you know, give some guidelines. Okay, so so take Coinbase. Brian Armstrong is, I mean, Well, they're they, forcing the they, SEC to respond, not... Yeah, they the, sue them. To respond. To respond, To yes, respond to, to the respond questions to the, to the, Hey, can you please <laughs> apply SEC regulations to our industry, which is which is a, an innovative oh, industry. Uh, you and I down, both know that. Slow down, let's explain this really, because this is important. The, so, the suit is against the SEC to just do their job, basically. Well, they, they filed a petition to say, hey, we would like to be regulated. We would we recommend that you take the SEC's existing laws and apply them to our industry. SEC just didn't respond. Gensler has been negative on crypto. And Brian Armstrong has done, as he's the CEO of Coinbase, has done everything right over the years. Here's, here's, been, the, here's the quote I got from, from uh, Brian, um, um, from the Coinbase CEO. The ex um, he, they sent the SEC a so-called petition for rulemaking. Yes. Last July, asking the regulated to propose and adopt rules for digital asset security. Give us guidance. It sought answers to 50 questions that would clarify certainty regarding regulatory treatment of digital asset security. And they got Basically nothing Basically like, we are booming, get your shit together and do your job. Yeah, and they got Set nothing back. Set some rules of engagement. Be because, because the government is, is, you know where the government is? They're back at Silk Road. Oh, this is using for ransomware, and it's used they don't know for what they're doing. drug trafficking, and, and little do they know that there's companies out there that actually now, so you think about it, the, the, you can, you can uh, the blockchain is public, you can identify what transactions have actually occurred on the blockchain, so every all these bad guys, you can now go after them. So the industry has advanced so much, and the well, problem I'll take the is, other, I'll take the other side. But, but wait, just let me finish. So the problem is that, that, that the U.S. government is trying to crush crypto. You got guys like Warren Buffett say, oh, no, crypto has no value. You got, you got G uh, Janet Yellen saying the same thing. Gensler's trying to kill crypto. Why is the U.S. government trying to kill such innovation and give it to uh, the rest of the world? I don't understand it. They should be, in, uh, there should be a public-private partnership. You're assuming that they're smart. That, that, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just basically no, saying you, that yeah, fundamentally there should be a public and private partnership that brings government and business together to make the U.S. more competitive. And the exact opposite is happening because a bunch of bureaucrats don't like crypto. It's, it's ridiculous. I think Go ahead, take the opposite side. I'm dying to hear this. Well, we, we should first lock that in for the rant section for the podcast. That <laughs> saves about 15 <laughs> minutes there, Brendan, on that one. All right, let me take the opposite. Okay, so first of all, you're wrong. How am I wrong? <laughs> I'm done. That's a wrap. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> John McLaughlin, wrong. <laughs> no, no I, no, I love the rant. First of all, you're assuming that they're smart, okay? And you said, no, you're not. You are assuming that they, that they, have their shit. they don't have their shit together. Our government, I've been saying this, I'm on, I'm on your side banging the table. I even going back to the covering the Jedi uh, snafu with Amazon and, uh, and Microsoft and Oracle. The government doesn't know what the fuck they're doing on lawmaking. They don't know tech and they don't know what's going on. So we need lawmakers that's going to understand that the growth of an industry, Coinbase saying we want to be a legit player and we want to play by the rules of engagement that the government and, and the laws will allow us and that's called an enablement strategy. And the issue at hand is, case in point is, the government's moving so slow, it's only been nine months. From the government standpoint, that's like not a, that's like what, no big deal. It's only been nine months. But from a Coinbase standpoint, I know you have accounts in Coinbase, we have accounts in Coinbase. Sure. That's like an eternity. Okay, so nine months is just not enough. That's that's way over the clock. They should have answers, at least clarifying answers to the 50 questions in three months. If they don't have that done, given it's not like it's just like an idea someone's proposing that we do crypto exchanges. It's actually there's 
real Americans that have accounts. I, I, so I, just, I, I feel like Coinbase is a really good business. I think they've always tried to do the right thing. Yeah, you know, you saw Binance try to do the reach around. Okay, well, I, I get that, but that's, you know, the, the bad apple shouldn't just kill the industry. The U.S. government has just got to get They get should, they together. should. They, the U.S. government should look at Coinbase like they looked at uh, the DNS system when Network Solutions took it over as the government and, and Explain that. Passed. So back in the internet days, the SAIC, Department of Commerce, ran the domain name system. That's how it runs all the servers. And so in SAIC is like a government uh, off balance sheet, like Northrum, like they do all like the government contracts, the like military shit. Uh, but they ran the technology and they do a lot of the OSS systems, a lot of the um, operation systems for the government. And so they, hey, this internet thing, so, so someone's got to oversee the servers. That was SAIC. They ended up giving that to Network Solutions in Herndon, Virginia, as a private company to run it. And the Department of Commerce had purview over that. And then ICANN took it over in 1998. Um, and so that allowed the internet to grow. No one screwed with the DNS. They let it simmer, saute, it grew, and enabled the internet, and ultimately the World Wide Web. HTTP, hypertext protocol, HTML, the internet web was born. Here we are. We had Fadi in if, shot. If there, if there was no if there was no government agency like that, we'd look like Facebook. You know, the web would never exist. It would look like a, a bunch AOL. of all It would be AOL online. Right? Well, and and so, so that was a good thing. So here, they could do that with Coinbase, saying, hey, an American company, let's get this under control, let's have a node in the crypto network, let's get behind Coinbase, and let's say this is a sovereignty nationalist issue, and let the Americans compete in a crypto world against the other global power players. Why not? Right. That, is a, that is like sound right logic. Absolutely, the sound. So logic. what do they do? They get in, and then and, you know, Fitzy over there at Platform Robbins, Charles Fitzgerald, he had a great post this week on the um, you know um, the arguments around um, you know taking down big companies. It's just you know, some people just feel like, oh, that's too big. Big companies are evil. Let's take it down. It's too big. Or oh my God, that would be really bad if a company like Coinbase would be successful. Capitalism is bad. I mean, come on, it's terrible. So I think. It, I think it's a strategic move that they should get behind Coinbase, foster more competition. Um, finance is not trustable. It puts out some guardrails. Uh, Coinbase, Brian Armstrong has always said, we're, we're happy to be regulated. You know, bring that on, and we'll, fo we'll follow whatever yeah. rules you put well, down. I mean, look, if we get presidents like Joe Biden, and who's going to be re-electing, if that guy can't- You mean re-running. He, he's oh, re-running. <laughs> he's he, announced he, he's going to re-run. Run well, again. Is you got Trump, you got an indicted president might run, and you got an old guy who can't read and speak running. So, I mean, give us somebody else some, you know, it's like, what the heck? Well, I mean, you got to, you got to. I mean, I got, I, I have another rant on this. I mean, I, I tell my, 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 my anti-Trump friends, look, is it really that hard to understand why <laughs> people are so pissed off at the government and a guy with, who's outspoken with a personality actually became president in 2016? And then I tell my, my, my friends that are pro-Trump, is it really that hard for you to believe that more than 50% of the population voted against Trump and that women came out in force and <laughs> voted against Trump? Is that really that hard? You have to chalk that up to, to voter wasn't fraud? The, wasn't the voting system really? corrupt? Really? Is that, is, is that? Wasn't the Dominion voting system you know, the that's problem? The, you know, that's what the, they, they, so, so they claim, they can't <laughs> fathom that somehow 50% of the population in this divided country, Anyway, I mean. It was it, a Dominion it, it, voting system. Just, what's that? It was Dominion's voting system was flawed. I read that, on, I heard that in Fox News. Oh, they got fired all the people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, <laughs> well there you go, that's Tucker's big, gone. Well, no, that's a big Don story. Lemon's Some, gone. You know, good segue, no, it's a good segue because that claim that the, the, the fraud was there just never happened, and they knew about it on the air. That's why they got a $780 million judgment against them. Okay, so Dan Rather gets skewered for you know, putting out false information. Uh, does, does, does Fox have to, you know, he do got they have fired the, too. Do they, yep, and do they have the same standard? Yes, it, it appears so. It, it's actually even worse. I mean, 700 plus million, 750 million dollars. That's a big number. But I mean, it just speaks to the state of media today, eight, eight, John. 787 million and a half. It just speaks to the state tax of deductible. media today. And, and the, the tax deductible. Yeah, but so what? It's an expense. I, I saw that narrative. <laughs> I was like, please, people. It's a tax write-off. Do you even know what you're talking about? That it's a ta it's expensable. Yeah, but it's not like it doesn't cost them seven hundred eighty million dollars in cash. They could use the write-off. No, it's expense. It's 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 an expense. Just like when you you know you. <laughs> 
<laughs> you buy an airplane ticket, it's an expense. It's not a tax write-off, it's, it's an expense. <laughs> it's expensable. That was such a dumb argument. But anyway. It does come off, the, off your revenue. It, uh, the, uh, the expense goes out the well, door. Well, it comes off your profit. Yeah, because, I mean, yeah. Profit, yeah, so, yeah, so profit. it lowers your profit, so it lowers your tax write, uh, pe tax yeah. exposure. I mean, that, that, Is me, it a tax write-off? To me, write -off? The, story, no. the story about Hunter, um, the story about Tucker Carlson and, and Fox is a classic Fox. Their number one star, he was by far the number one draw. Yeah, he took over for Bill O'Reilly. Okay? Yeah. And they don't care, Fox is the story, they are the star. They have the audience, so Bill O'Reilly got fired, he, Tucker's gone, Glenn Beck before him. Uh, they don't care, I mean, they, they don't value the talent. Mm -hmm. and then $780 million, they think they'd care, and there's more to come. Right? Really, I, there is? Yes, yeah, absolutely, there's, there's, there's other, firms that are suing Fox, and they have the same evidence. You know, you know this, so yeah, it's, uh, it's again, it speaks to the state of media trust, right? So, you know, is it going to be, what do you think about that? Is there going to be a media renaissance? Is it going to be like a, are we going to rise from the ashes like a phoenix with actually I good think, reporting? I think it's going to be. Where, where bloggers and, and, you know, is it, you know, web 2.0 all over again? Where well, I think citizens, open source writers? software, well, open source software, we're joking about the, you know, copying software and pirating software. I think you're going to see an open source movement around media, where you're going to see proprietary models go away and you're going to see open collective intelligence networks for form. The, you know, the expression, the hive mind, people talk about Facebook. I think you're going to see people value reporting via subscription and or other community supported uh, efforts. The hive mind becomes these community portals. They become a community networks where people participate. I think that's going to be all open. No proprietary, think about software. There is almost no proprietary software business model anymore. It's open source, mainly. Yeah, Oracle's got a pretty good proprietary business model. Well, I mean, software. well, yeah, they, that's their moat, but it's not like they, they have a monopoly on databases. I can get an open source database. I don't need to like buy Oracle unless I have a use case that requires hardened Oracle grade proprietary yeah. software. So the old model was, um, because of proprietary software. Wait, wait, what's your point on that? Uh, I'm, uh, you're saying that media is proprietary. Would you agree? Yes. New York Times has their stuff. Sure. You okay. Can get so it. that's you can the analogy. It. You can read it. Yeah. Okay. You know, but so that'll th that'll continue. Wall Street Journal, me, whatever, and that'll continue to get chipped away, just like you know, they're the any proprietary business. Yeah. They're the oracles. Yeah. Well, I'd rather have Oracle's business than the New York Times. <laughs> Any day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Mar Oracle's market share in databases is what? Compared to where it was. Well, it's in their little world, it's pretty good. <laughs> I, I want to get something in here, because as you know, John, we follow pretty closely what's happening in the marketplace. And I spend you know, a lot of time reporting on this with breaking analysis and our friends at ETR. And I'll tell you, it's just such mixed signals right now. I was just writing down this morning. So banks are down, J&J &J had a strong quarter, autos are up, GM had a great quarter, they, they, they guided up. Consumer staples are really strong. Things like toothpaste and diapers, McDonald's, Coca-Cola, they have pricing power. Housing soft, advertising is down, right? Google, and then tech and cloud. Now people are talking that, that it's a big week for tech earnings. Amazon, Google, or Alphabet, and Microsoft all announced this week. Yep. And there's talk that we're not even so much worried about Q1, because that's what they're reporting on now. It's really, it's going to be what's happening in Q2. People are saying that AWS is going to be only 10% growth in Q2. So people are like, oh my God, AWS, the cloud, must be repatriation. No, here's what my sources are telling me, that what Amazon is doing is they're locking in longer term contracts, so they're being very proactive. So people are saying, the narrative is, oh, Amazon's losing market share, oh, they must be going back on prem. That's not what's happening. Amazon's being really smart. They're going for the long game. They're going to customers yeah. and being proactive and say, let's lock in to a, a better deal for you. Okay, so they are locking in market share, in my opinion. It's going to be really interesting to see. And Palo Alto see. Networks is doing the same thing. They got a three-year deal, you got your one-year free. That's causing a lot of people shaking their heads at this new model, locking in people for the long term. I think it's smart. Is I it think a recession it's, it, gap play, or is it just they're going to amortize I, that over I, three I, years and change the pricing? I think, well, no, I think they've recognized the current conditions, say that our customers need help. Let's go help them, let's help them lower their bill, and build loyalty. I think it's really smart, and I think what you're I like see, that approach. I think the cloud is going to come yeah. roaring back when the tech market roars back. I think there's no question about it. Yeah, and I, and I think also, we, as we pointed out on our post when we interviewed Andy, uh, Adam Selevsky was, this next gen cloud's here. We're, there's a super cloud component, there's super apps, you have this horizontal scalable data layer emerging, you have now open tool chains for coding AI. 
I just think there's going to be a massive renaissance on big data that will end up fueling and accelerating this next generation cloud architecture, which will, sh will create more ecosystem-like play. Think about it, Snowflake, they're a data warehouse in the cloud, or data cloud as they call it, but they're a data warehouse. They have an ecosystem, they have a venture fund. They fund companies to build on top of Snowflake. That, they're not an ISV. Well, they, they are started a, they as are a, a, they are a platform. They, they started as a simpler data warehouse. That's how they got into the market, yeah. and now they are truly building data bricks, a data cloud. Same exact thing. Yeah. These are companies that were once viewed as ISVs as part of a SaaS play, are building on top of the hyperscale clouds, yeah. and they are getting their customers to build on top of them. That's a platform, that's an ecosystem. That's this next-gen cloud, and then when you start connecting environments together, not just clouds, but data sets, edge, you have now a completely new distributed and computing we, paradigm. We, we call that super cloud, we, you know, sometimes we take a lot of heat for that, but there's a clear trend where, to your point, and that, that, that underscores that, they're not ISVs, they're not just software players, they're platform players, and that's the big, the big change in the coming decade. We're well, seeing it right before our eyes. Well, we have a lot of f fodder for our podcast on Friday um, coming out, so uh, check out our podcast. Dave uh, has a breaking analysis podcast that's getting a lot of traction over uh, multiple years now. Uh, it is a must subscribe if you are in the business of cloud, AI, data, checking out the latest buying trends. It's got a great source of data with ETR combined with our observational data, so that analysis, it's free. I mean, I mean, IDC and Gartner should be charging at least 50 grand an episode, in my opinion, but that's, it's free. The QPod that we're doing, that's on its eighth episode, that's just us riffing. We're going to start sharing some of the things that we talk about in private, publicly with you. We're going to bring on guests from theCUBE. We're just getting going, so check out the Cube podcast. Uh, that's episode eight. Uh, you can go to siliconangle.com, cube.net, check it out. And again, we're going to continue to make content free and open and, and build that community out, Dave. That's again, loyal loyalty from our fan base and customer base, very critical. So again, more, more coverage. Four days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage here at RSA. Top publications are here at Broadcast Alley. The Cube, SiliconANGLE, the live coverage continues after this short break. <laughs>